Hello, this is Deborah Anderson, a Black woman animator. Come back to you with another video. And in this video, I have Philip Duncan. Welcome. Hello. <laughs> so can you give like a little brief 20 to 30 second intro about what you do? Uh, okay, so what I do currently, so I work for DreamWorks uh, Animation on the television side. I am in what is called the hub department. So basically our department kind of um, sets up the assets. Like, you know, we create all the assets pre uh, for a television show. So we kind of set it up. And then uh, at some point, our overseas partners kind of take over. So we kind of are like mm -hmm. the startup and we kind of get everything kind of the ball rolling and we go that. Uh, I specifically am a lead for the hair department. So mm -hmm. I usually say that's like a digital hair stylist, basically, mm -hmm. and creator. So we get, uh, I get, uh, you know, designs for animals or human hair or whatever. And I have to mm -hmm. kind of create that in the um, programs that we use, create it. And we get it out um and that's pretty much it sometimes we do other stuff like we're going grass for sets as mm -hmm. well uh, but primarily it's focused around here so i'm the lead so i kind of over not only do i uh, help um lot shows but i also oversee the overseas studios and make sure that they're still on the right path when they send in um, their their work and stuff like that so kind of like a supervisor kind of like an artist at the same time so that's what i currently do so there you cool go. So let's get started. Where are you from and how was it growing up? Uh, well, I was born, if you can't tell by this A's hat, I was born in Oakland, California. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I guess I was there for, I mean, it's funny because I'm one of those guys that was like, I was born there, but I lived most of my life in LA. So I think my parents moved down here was like five or something like that. Uh, but I still have a strong connection to, to Oakland for some reason. But um, mostly grew up in LA. Uh, I mostly grew up in kind of what you would guess to consider the hoods of South Central uh, mm -hmm. or or Los Angeles. So I did live in South Central, lived in Inglewood, lived in Watts. Uh, but I've also been all over the place as well. Like I've also lived in the Culver City and stuff like that. So I kind of got a good sense of um, the L.A. Um, area. Um, I... Uh, went to the art institute in california los angeles that was my um college um it was more of a trade school it was mm -hmm. focused more on like the arts and stuff like that also i had like culinary department i don't even know if they still exist anymore i think they do they might have still campuses in like pittsburgh or something like that i think they were their headquarters um but i was there um and that's pretty much as far as the educational part <laughs> i don't know if you want to get into professional stuff yet but that's kind of how I kind of grew up and love sports and love movies and TV shows, geek nerd, got a whole bunch of <laughs> stuff there. And trust me, there's even more downstairs. So yeah, definitely grew up in the, the nerd culture for sure. So what are some of your best childhood memories? Um, well, uh, I will say like before I got into doing what I do now for work, um, definitely baseball was my thing. I actually still play on an adult league team um mm -hmm. here in uh in in uh like around north hollywood area in the valley so i still play so a lot of my like childhood memories do involve playing sports um it's just huge sports fan and stuff like that and so you know uh definitely playing little league and having my dad on some teams and mm -hmm. playing that and still playing now so i mean those are some you know obviously i have a, good memories I have a brother and we would play camping trips stuff like that with family was also also awesome so mm -hmm. um so I, you know i had a pretty i had a pretty good uh upbringing considering the you know what the perception of the places that i lived in mm -hmm. uh were at um so yeah so i i mean I, I enjoyed definitely a blessing for sure so what is specifically your relationship with art and animation throughout your childhood so um I mean, it, it was a big part. Saturday morning cartoons, you know, for sure. Uh, growing up all the time, um, I would wake up early to watch, you know. Um, it started off with the, uh, the uh, oh, what would you call it? Uh, Pee Wee's Playhouse was like the mm -hmm. first kind of thing to introduce. Then it got into some of the other cartoons like the G.I. Joes and like the He-Mans and all the other stuff. But then obviously, you know, I don't want to say graduated, but, you know, the WB for kids morning. So you had Animaniacs, Tiny Toons, the X-Men series, which is still great. 
Um, and then, you know, even I even dipped into the anime at an early age with like Sailor Moon and stuff. I didn't know what it was. It was dope. I watched it. I admit it. I don't care. I like Sailor Moon. So, uh, <laughs> yeah. So definitely for sure grew up watching a, a ton of cartoons when I was mm -hmm. young, for sure. And still do. Were you, did you draw or? Um, I wasn't, I don't think I was a, a good art. I mean, I liked drawing, but I kind of realized early on I wasn't good. So I remember actually getting, they used to have these books where you can actually trace what the, the picture is. So I kind of remember distinctively, I, I was in my monster truck phase. So I'd get these big, big foot, um, which was like the, the big, uh, what do you call it? Like a, it would jump over and crush cars and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, so I, they, I remember getting a book and it had like art of the Bigfoot, but what you, what the, the purpose of the book was, you could take the tracing paper and you would place it over the art and you would trace out the art. And then when you, you know, took off your paper, you had your, your drawing. So that's where <laughs> most of my art came from at a certain age. Cause I just, I, I mean, I had to ask my mom if I was remember playing with crayons or anything like that but i just know that i don't think i was that very good early on so i was like you know what i like this look let me just kind of trace it um and so then, what gave you the confidence to like continue how, what gave you the confidence to pursue animation despite not being artistic for anybody out there who might not feel like they're artistic yeah uh it, i was really in computers so mm -hmm. i think that was my thing because i was really kind of technology savvy so as soon as i found like oh you can do this on a computer and I don't actually have to put hand to paper. Oh yeah, no, I can get into that. And I was actually, actually one of the things that, you know, kind of got me into this business somewhat is, you know, uh, like I said, a huge star Wars fan and stuff like that. And so I think right around that time, right around the high school time, uh, they had re-released the original trilogy in theaters as like a re-release. So I'd always seen it on TV, so I never really got to see it on a huge screen. And, you know, seeing that, it just inspired me again. I wanted to do the effects that they were doing for, like, the space battles and stuff like that. Um, you know, so, like, in high school, my you know, a couple of my last years, was like, okay, well, how do I do that? And then, you know, finding out, oh, it's all, mo not all, but mostly in the computers that weren't obviously miniatures and stuff like that. But, you know, use the computers to kind of do some of that stuff. And then, you know, 3D was still kind of really new, but it was starting to get bigger because I think Toy Story was released around that time and everybody was like super crazy. And I was like, ooh. And again, it was computer generated. So I was like, oh, I don't have to, I don't actually have to put pen to paper. I can actually do this on a computer. I like computers. I can work with computers. So that actually was how I was able to kind of still keep the artistic side, but not actually doing pen to paper. And I do tell a lot of students um, when I, you know, when I was teaching and stuff like that for a brief time. Uh, and even students that I talked today that, you know, one of the big questions I get is like, well, do I have to learn how to draw or do I have to draw to be in this industry? And I'm like, no, I suck. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a good artist. I suck. If you add me to add, draw me to draw something, I could, I, I would, it's very hard for me not to make it look ugly. I remember there's this one art class where I had to take during college and it was like, you had to, so you had to actually during college, I actually had to take drawing classes and stuff. Um, but it was, it was uh, like fine arts or something like that, but we had to do a self portrait. Right. Mm -hmm. And so I'm done. I'm thinking, Oh man, this looks good. Da, da, da. And I get at, you know, I look at it from a distance I swear to you, I think I drew Chris Rock and I don't look anything like Chris Rock. And I was like, OK, I'm clearly not <laughs> meant to do, you know, pen the paper type thing, but I'm still able to kind of, you know, go with this industry. So I always tell people like, you know, I'm I'm not very good or at least I don't think I'm very good at doing the arts. So you don't or drawing. So you don't have to kind of pigeonhole yourself and know like, well, if I can't draw, I guess I can't be in this industry. There are a lot of jobs in this industry that you can get that don't have to deal directly with putting pen to paper or pencil to yeah. paper or whatever to paper. So were your uh, parents supportive of your artistic endeavors? Oh, yeah, for sure. Um, I mean, I think obviously as a kid, I think they were just, you know, little arts, put it on the refrigerator and stuff like that for sure. I think when it came to the college choosing there was a little, they supported me throughout everything I wanted to do for sure. Um, but there, I think there was a little hesitation of not necessarily what I wanted to do, but where I wanted to go to do it. 
Um, I think they were kind of still in the traditional line of like a four year college or something like that. Um, mm -hmm. They weren't necessarily pushing like, oh, it has to be a university or a private school. It, you know, they were fine with like community college, but it was just like the traditional structure for that. And uh, it's actually kind of a funny story, sort of. So, um, you know, during my last year of high school, like I thought I was good enough on the baseball team to be like, hey, I'm going to go to college and have a baseball scholarship. So I'm like, didn't turn out that way. And that was right around the time that, you know, I realized like I might probably need to do something else, go into a different direction after I graduated high school. And again, that was right around the time we released the Star Wars and, and to a story. And so I was like, okay, I definitely want to do this. I kind of made the choice. I want to do this. So the last few days in high school, I kind of really concentrated on doing 3d stuff and whatever I could on the computer anyway. So graduated and, you know, still trying to figure out colleges. Um, you know, uh, I think my parents were more leaning to like Cal State Dominguez Hills. Cause that was a college my mom went to, but you know, I'm looking around cause I, you know, I don't know about their art program. I don't know if they have 3d classes or anything like that. So that was kind of like the, the, I don't want to say it was, it was definitely never uh, any animosity or anything like that, but it was definitely one of the things where it's like, I went in there, but like, are you sure you want to go to, you know, that? And what happened was it was funny because uh, back in those uh, days, they would send out VHS tapes for these kind of mm -hmm. trade schools. VH tapes, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you're not as old as I am, there are these cassette things you put in. It's even precursor to, to DVDs and all that anyway. So they, so the you school put it into something called a VCR. Yeah, VCR. <laughs> um, and so the school that I eventually ended up going was, were sending out these promo tapes because the school was just starting out. So they needed to kind of get students in. So I remember they sent me the tape, put it in the VHS. I watched it. And of course, it's just like 3D stuff all the place and doing art. Like, hey, we're in art school and stuff like that. And I was like, ooh, okay, that's kind of good. I kind of like that. But I'm like, mm, I didn't, wasn't liking too much of what they were presenting so i was just mm -hmm. like eh. and i couldn't get into the traditional i don't want to say traditional but the more well-known art college like um otis or cal arts or something like that because i didn't actually have a good because you need to have like a portfolio of that stuff to get into those schools and like i said i wasn't really good at that mm -hmm. so i couldn't go into those but this one wasn't asking for any of that but i was like eh, it's not those two so i remember throwing that into the trash like the tape i was like okay i watched it great doing it in the trash and i always give my brother credit for this so he fished it out of the trash and gave it back to me. It was like, I think you need to watch this again. Cause at the time I still hadn't really decided where I wanted to go. And so mm -hmm. he gave it to me and I watched it again. And eventually I decided to go. And then when I told my parents, I was like, Hey, okay, I decided. And they were very supportive. They're like, okay, that's where you want to go. That's what you want to do. Just go ahead and do it. But I got to give him like a shout out to my brother for actually, uh, uh, fishing that thing out of the trash and, you know, I probably wouldn't be here <laughs> today if he didn't do that. So. Nice. But yeah, they were, my, my parents were very supportive. So um, I'm going to list out some projects that you worked on and then sure. you're going to have to fill in the blanks for what IMDB did not, where IMDB stops. <laughs> okay. It stops in like 2017. So. Okay. Oh yeah, sorry. I I have not updated. I've worked on something since then. I've mostly yeah, DreamWorks so TV I'll, projects. But go ahead. I'll we'll tag team. I'll throw it to you after I'm okay. done. But okay. I'll just list what's on your IMDb. So Team America: World World Police, mm -hmm. A Fantastic Four, Fireman and Sam, The Chronicles of Narnia, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, uh, Garfield: A Tale of Two Kitties, Night at the Museum, Evan Almighty, The Golden Compass, Alvin and the Chipmunks. The Mummy, Tomb of the Dragon Emperor, Land of the Lost, Wolfman, the A-Team, Hop, uh, The Cabin in the Woods, Alvin and Chipmunk ship, Chipwrecked, <laughs> uh, The, the Hunger Games, <laughs> Snow White and the Huntsman, R.I.P.D., and then it stops at All Hail King Julian Exiles. So continue okay. with whatever so you remember. <laughs> yeah, so from, from there, um, oh, so I just want to say that those, oh, oh, those up to King Julian, we're all uh, VFX projects um, mm -hmm. and we can kind of get into my career later, but there's a kind of a difference between the VFX side and then the animation side at an animation studio. So as soon as you hit King Julian, uh, that's when I got my job at DreamWorks. And so mm -hmm. from King Julian, it goes um, uh, the Puss in Boots TV show. I don't know if there was a subtitle for that show. I don't remember, uh, mm -hmm. but the boss baby um, uh, Kung Fu village and, um, 
uh let's see the fast and the furious uh spy racers uh jurassic it's, it's jurassic world or jurassic park i think it's jurassic world uh camp cretaceous um and i think i want to say i'm missing some but i think that's it but there was like multiple seasons of those shows so mm -hmm. um those were the shows that yeah i worked on at, at dreamworks okay so for anybody who doesn't know, can you generally describe technical animation and then kind of get into what you specifically do um, and what, what your specialty is? Okay. And then you can kind of split it between the VFX and the animation. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. So, um, so it's, <laughs> it's called different things uh, depending on what studio. So uh, like I said, what I do is like hair creation. So typically what happens is, you know, you get a design for a character, you know, different department does that, um, you know, goes through the channels and then it gets to your plate. And then essentially what you have to do is you have to look at the drawing. So let's say it was, you know, um, I don't know, uh, Rihanna's kind of more Bob style haircut or whatever mm -hmm. that a character has. Uh, so then you would have to go into uh, whatever 3D program you do uh, or using and you basically have to create that hair from scratch. You have to, you know, and now I say grow, but essentially uh, think of it like if you're molding clay, right? You know, you have like a bald head and then you had to have air. So then you hair to it. So then you take other pieces of clay, you, you know, put it on, you start shaping and moving and start styling it and stuff like that. Um, and that's pretty essentially what you do. But you're obviously doing that in a computer program on the screen. Uh, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, be taking, you know, uh, color cues, whatever they color it and do all the other stuff. The other technical side part of it is once you've actually created it, you know, typically animations usually don't, depending on the budget, um, you know, the hair has to move, right? Hair moves in, in reality. So we have to do it. So depending on the budget, you know, you might actually have to animate the hair. And so what I would do is either set up controls or help the rigging department set up controls be like, hey, this is what the hair is going to move my like, set it up like this. Or we run a dynamic system. So dynamic systems in simulation to where you set up a kind of a environment for the hair uh, to kind of move naturally. So you just kind of hit a play button and it kind of just does whatever the character does. There's obviously more technical stuff that goes into it. But in the overall scheme of things, that's typically what working on hair does uh, or what I do. Uh, what I do. So, um, so that's kind of like the technical part of it. Um, now, depending on where you're at in the process. So for VFX, um, the difference between VFX and, uh, like working in an animation studio, like DreamWorks where I work at or Pixar or something like that, um, is typically for VFX, usually it's another studio. So like, let's say it's, you know, Fox at the time, um, mm -hmm. would have a movie, like, let's say RIPD, you know, um, and then what they do is they do bids for different, you know, VFX houses at the time I was, or most of those movies or pretty much all of them were done at, um, Rhythm and Hughes. Um, and so the VFX houses kind of bid on how many shots they're going to take from the movie. And then, you know, they're given that. And then essentially what we do is we do the effects over the live action, you know, plates that we actually get in some cases or, the character is completely not there and it's a total digital character. And then we got to mm -hmm. put that character in there. So that's typically what VFX is. It's usually, um, you, you know, the work is usually outsourced to that company and then you kind of do it over the top in animation studios like DreamWorks or, or Pixar um, is it's all kind of encompassed within that organization. It's all Disney. It's all Pixar. Like, so they're not typically um, outsourcing all the work is usually done in house, you know, everything is more contained. You're not usually going outside the studio. You have your, all your artists on campus and they're, mm -hmm. you know, doing basically all the stages for you there. So it's a little bit more contained, um, in that case. And, you know, typically you're not working with live action on animation studios, pretty much VFX is all live action. Um, there's rarely a case where it's not and live action, streaming TV, that kind of thing you're working with, you know, humans, stuff like that. Um, whereas animation, it's all on the computer. It's, you know, you're not usually blending the two. Um, yeah, so that's pretty much the main difference. Um, but my job pretty much is the same for both if I was doing VFX or uh, animation. Just the difference is, is, you know, maybe the hair on the VFX film needs to be much, much more realistic because you're trying to re replicate, you know, what uh, a real life object. So like for 
uh, Chronicles of Narnia and Aslan, the lion, I kind of worked on that. You just want to make sure that the ma it looks like a lion. <laughs> it looks like a real right. lion. Whereas on the animation side, it could be more stylized. It could be more mm -hmm. kind of, you know, fancier and stuff like that. It's not quote unquote realistic on that mm -hmm. side. So you have a little bit more leeway. Right? So that's kind of the two main difference of my job versus the two different um, types of industry. But they're related, but not related. Yeah. Um, so let's see. Do, 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 do. So I know you did like the fur and bed simulation on Garfield, cloth and wire on a, a team, like muscles and leaf simulation, land of the lost. What, what does, what do the various kinds of simulation, uh, from your perspective, add to the movies that people would maybe notice if it wasn't there? So that nuance. I mean, well, that's that's it right there. Like, having noticed it like you know i always say like if you do such a good job that no one notices that you know the hair was simulated or something like that like mm -hmm. uh like one of my favorite shots that i worked on on aslan for crocs and Narnia is like he's walking up uh like some mountaintop he's talking to the character uh but there's like a light wind in the background so if you look at the flags the actual things that they shot on set when they're actually mm -hmm. doing this thing you know you can see that there's flags blowing and the grass is kind of blowing in the, in the background and stuff and so you know i remember the shot i have to make the hair blow in the wind i have to have it wind because if it was just completely still you know even little kids will notice like wait there's something a little weird that everything else in the background is blowing in the wind but then he's just kind of stiff like you know he's walking but the hair's not moving or anything like that so right. i always say that you know simulation what simulation adds is definitely a more realistic um movement to it um mm -hmm. than if you were hand animating it by keyframes now you can get really really good hand keyed animation but when it comes to hair and simulation it's a lot of hair there's you know yeah. it's not like moving a character who has you know four limbs or four legs if you're talking about a line or something like that and so for me when you can get a simulation to look really good and it blends right in there that no one really picks it up you just move through the next yeah. scene and you just didn't be like man that looked really weird in that case mm -hmm. like when that happens you know you've done a good job and so yeah. uh for me when kids are watching even much even animation shows too like yes they're more stylized and more quote unquote cartoony um yeah. you you know when you have you know a character stick their head out of a car window like in the fast series if their hair is not moving it's going to be kind of a, someone will kind of pick up on that. So, yeah. so for me, it's just, you know, trying to make sure that, um, you know, people don't notice that, you know, um, I think you'll kind of get that a lot across a lot of the stuff that we do in CG, whether it be for mm -hmm. VFX or, or animation is when you can watch a show and people are just concentrating on the story and the characters and yeah, they can look at it. I mean, first one comes on the screen, it looks really, really good. Like I'm really proud of, Jurassic Park Camp Cretaceous, I think it's one of the better looking shows that we've ever done at DreamWorks. Mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those things where it's just like, you get to look at it and it's like, wow, we did a really good job on that. And you don't notice like the grass moving when they're running through the bushes or when a character yeah. falls and their hair's like, because you're sucked into the story. And if it doesn't take you out visually to where you're like, well, that looked really, really weird. You've done a good job. You're, you're done mm -hmm. because people are sucked into the story. They don't, all that visual stuff is just normal. Like, hey, yeah. yeah, that's what's supposed to happen. So, yeah. So for me, when I hit that stage, I, I know we've done a good job. And that's kind of a little explanation of like kind of how simulation will really help. It's just more, more, um, more detail for sure. Yeah. I remember watching one of those King Kong movies from years ago. And mm -hmm. he was like running through the jungle with the woman in his hand. Mm -hmm. And it mm -hmm. looked horrible even though it was fast paced i was like what that, that looks like <laughs> trash <laughs> yeah yeah it's it's all look it's all a collaborative effort because i could do whatever you know i can from from mm -hmm. our from our department side but if the lighting is off you know mm -hmm. like let's say you know the sun's up here but then they have the shadow going the opposite direction it's like wait a second you know that looks a little weird or they're lit from the wrong side like so it's very collaborative that mm -hmm. you know when it comes to these things that we're doing like you know, I, I know a lot of people just kind of go in the movie, they see the end result, they see it's beautiful, yeah. it's, it's great looking, it's all the other stuff. But, you know, I, I do, uh, when, you know, uh, students or anybody that's trying to get into this industry, when they get in, they, they'll they find out it's definitely uh, a big thing, to a big production to get everything together, 
to get that looking as mm -hmm. good as it is. And, you know, one department kind of falls a little bit, it will kind of, you know, uh, people will call it out. I mean, I'll just say, you know, Sonic the Hedgehog. <laughs> mm -hmm. I mean, when that movie came out, it was like, that does not look like Sonic, right? You know, it's those kind of decisions. And, you know, all the people that did the fur and the hair on whatever that thing was that they came out the first time looking like, you know, they probably did a really good job. Like if I was just, you know, you know, commenting on hair, if I'm just going to take yeah. my department and I'm looking at what the character is, like they did a decent job on the hair, but and I can't get past what somebody told them to do. <laughs> I've, yeah, no, typically that's usually house. But then at some point you're like, okay, the hair is great, but that thing looks horrific. That does not look like Sonic the Hedgehog. Everybody knows what Sonic the Hedgehog looked like, and that does not look like Sonic the Hedgehog. Mm -hmm. So, you know, yes, it's not my department. I did a job, you know, they gave us this, we did this to make it look good, but in the end, people were going to stop and, you know, if you mess up one of these things, they're going to call it out. You know, people nowadays are, like, really good at, like, knowing their thing and, and to do and to get something like that for for a property like that, for example. I mean, you see, you saw what happened and they had to 180 that course. And I will, I got to give them credit, you know, what they eventually came up with actually looked fairly good. And the yeah. funny thing was, you know, getting back to my point about, you know, doing your department job and making it look good so people don't notice is that when they released the new look of him and everybody was kind of like okay that looks better you know i'm pretty mm -hmm. sure people would be like oh his shoes aren't big enough or <laughs> his gloves aren't wide enough or whatever but you know you get the basic that looks like sonic out of the way mm -hmm. you can actually just concentrate on the movie and when i right. finally saw it i was like hey this is not bad you know especially for uh, a trend of video game movies not really being good when they actually, mm -hmm. you know, go from video game to screen. And I was like, hey, this actually isn't bad. But if they kept the look of what it looked like before in CG, the movie could the movie was the exact same, you know, but only his look changed. And there had been no way people wouldn't have gotten over that mm -hmm. to concentrate on what the actual story was. So it's actually kind of very important that, you know, everything kind of comes together and merges correctly. I don't even know if that even answered your question. <laughs> yeah, it did. <laughs> so, you know, with animation being more of a collaborative thing, um, I know in in our industry, there's like a lot of like introverts and different personalities, but what do you, what is the positive of like being in studio with a collaborative one? I know, you know, sometimes you just hop over to somebody's desk and just yep. ask a question, <laughs> but like yeah. from being, from everything going remote, what's the, what do you miss about the like in studio i mean that right well, you just nailed it right on the head you know it's a collaborative i mean i've always been kind of a um i like working in a kind of a, a people environment you know mm -hmm. i do like that you know you can kind of just hear conversations amongst people talking it's kind of like that ambient noise like have you ever been in like new york city or something like the hustle and bustle of like new york city yeah. like you just kind of get used to that or whatever and i'm pretty sure if you walk down the street when the pandemic started and it was just like nothing no cars and you'd be like this is like weird right and you realize you miss that kind of hustle bustle i mean you don't probably like getting walked over in new york city or anything like that but at the same time you're just kind of used to that thing and this is i feel it's like the same kind of thing in uh our industry at least specifically at where at dreamworks where you know you know you can just turn to your right, talk to some dude, like, hey, whatever. And then, you know, you can get up, go to the desk. If you need to talk to your you know, supervisor and you need to talk about this and just go over there. Mm -hmm. And it's just, and, and just the natural kind of human element that, you know, just as humans, we are kind of, we want to be with other humans, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, I think that's the most asset aspect that, of it I miss. I mean, DreamWorks is a fantastic place to work. So our culture in and of itself is just, really good anyway so mm -hmm. you know yes we have the work aspect we just have the personality aspect of just hanging out or being at the fountain or getting lunch in the lunch line just talking with people and you know you know shooting the shit and stuff like that like it's mm -hmm. like that part is the stuff that i miss you know the work part is good it's great you know i like the coverage but it's the talking the hanging out the, hey mm -hmm. did you see that episode last night you know the kind of water toilet cooler talk and stuff like that that we have you know and that and i and i do miss that so um yeah that's the one definitely thing that i miss about you know not not being at work currently um in the office i should say so let's go back in time a little bit to sure. you know the the green square situation that we had with vfx like can mm. you kind of talk about that and like 
why exactly like how are VFX studios set up that a lot of them ended up closing? Um it's funny that you mentioned that because I was I I don't want to I don't know if it's 100% accurate, but I would say I think the situation at Rhythm and Hughes is the one that actually started that. So if mm-hmm. people that don't know, um so basically what happened is Rhythm and Hughes uh won the academy award for life of pi right mm-hmm. and for visual effects and i believe his name was bill wessenhofer i think that's how you pronounce his last name i, I forgot how to pronounce him you know but he you know he goes up on stage and this is at the oscars this is being broadcast live and uh at that time rhythm and hughes was on the verge of bankruptcy it was like kind of in the news that we were going to go bankrupt and mm-hmm. so the oscars were happening and so um, there was already kind of a green, uh, a swell of, you know, people, you know, getting ready to, I think there were some protesters outside of the Academy Awards and stuff like that. And, you know, so he gets up, we win, which was kind of surprising. And then he starts to go on a speech about how in the VFX industry, the workers are basically put through the ringer to put it lightly. You know, we're talking a lot of man work hours and all this other stuff. And they played him off the stage with the Jaws theme. And it was like a big thing. Now, you know, like I said, you know, I would say maybe a month or so before that happened, it was already starting a groundswell of like, we're probably, we may be, there may be protests or there will be protests, um, maybe strikes and stuff like that. But the problem, getting back to your original question with the VFX and the thing with that, is there are no unions for the VFX Mm -hmm. industry which is a problem. Um, it's been a problem for years. Um, I am not a super supreme expert from it, so I can only tell it from my perspective. Mm-hmm. But basically, um, it, it, it's very, very hard, intense labor. And I know people that are watching this, but like, you work on movies, like, you know, you work on films, like, isn't it supposed to be, you know? Um, and, you know, just the nature of the VFX industry is tough because like i kind of mentioned earlier you know what's happening when it comes to vfx studios um is you know a movie will come out like let's say you know the new venom movie come out they have you know x 500 shots that are going to need vfx work in it i'm just throwing out a random number i don't know what it is um Mm -hmm. and what big studios will do is they essentially will pit other vfx studios essentially against themselves to try to get the lowest bid number so you have Rhythm and Hughes, you know, because they need the work. They have all these employees. We need to get paid. So they're like, hey, we'll do, you know, 500. You know, we'll do the whole 500. We'll take the whole movie for X amount of dollars. I'm just throwing out mm-hmm. $1 million. I mean, it's more than that, but I just thought mm-hmm. it a number. But then you'll have another studio, like, let's say Digital Domain or something like that. And they'll be like, well, no, we want to do that too. We'll do that for half that price. Same number of shots, half that price. And Rhythm and Hughes is like, no, but we're there. So essentially... It's studios biting against each other. Race and to the bottom. It's race to the bottom. And you know that, you know, studio head studios are just doing this because they know that they can get their work done in for a cheaper price. I mean, it's all about the money. Bottom line, so every, like a lot of things in this life, unfortunately, it comes down to the money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so if you're a worker in that VFX industry, typically it's a race to the bottom. And what typically happens is a studio will basically be really undercutting their price to do the amount of shots that we need to do and all the work that goes in like a lot. And unfortunately that stuff flows downhill. And so when you have, and you know, I think I forgot what movie I was working on, but I was working on one movie um, as an example of what happens to the workers is you're working like, you know, 80 hour weeks because, Hey, we bid for this project. We have to get X number of shots done in three months. Right. Mm -hmm. Which Again, they only do that because they need to take the work. But the reality is like, hey, if you actually put it in a vacuum and actually broke down what it would really take to do those shots, it's probably like, hey, you know, you said three months. No, this would really actually take a year, a year and a half to do all this stuff. And you're condensing it all into three months. So essentially, what does that do? We got to push the work. It's got to work maximum overtime. We got to, you know, less breaks. You know, we got to either hire more people if they want to go that route or if they can't hire more people than the people we have they're doing triple overtime during the weekends and all this other stuff so it's it's all kind of connected based on decisions yeah. and stuff that's made and so unfortunately when it came to the green square it was like 
hey, you know, all these blockbuster movies that you're making for the VFX side, there's, you know, hundreds upon hundreds of workers that are working on this. And I mean, if you actually stay all throughout the credits to see the hidden thing at the end and you get to the VFX side, there's like hundreds of names there. And then you got to equate that to, you know, God knows how many hours they had to work on or what the time crunch was in order to kind of get all that stuff out. And essentially it's all about, you know, man hours. Usually it's really cheap pay too, because again, the studio has to save money because they undercut themselves for that bid. Yeah. So it's like, okay, well, how are we going to make up money? Well, we got to, we got to pay less, you know, pay less to do, you know, a job that, you know, is three times what the worker should be getting for it. So it's all these things kind of combined. And it's just like, you know, at that time we were just kind of tired of it because it was like, Mm -hmm. you know, you have these big blockbusters that are making billions upon billions of dollars for, you know, the top people, the CEOs or whatever, and it doesn't kind of get translated. And for VFX, it's even worse because again, more than likely the studio, the VFX studio house, let's say Rhythm Hughes, for example, isn't getting a cut of that at all. Mm-hmm. It's all going back to the studio that actually we're paying them because, you know, a lot of the time it's like, we're just going to pay you this fee, like this one lump right. sum, like, you know, we're going to pay you a million dollars. Right. But then the movie makes $50 billion. It was like, yeah, but you know, can we get a piece of that? We kind of helped it. You know, we, you know, 50% of the movie is visual effect. Nah, we already paid you. You, you signed a contract already. It's only, only a million dollars. That's it. You don't get any of that. So for the VFX side, that's kind of the, the, the big issue that, and it, unfortunately it's still happening today, you know, mm-hmm. and I know I'm, I'm just rambling on here, but um, the, you know, getting back to the point, there is no union. You know, if there was, I think at that time also, not only was it kind of a, a wake up call of like, Hey, you know, the green square represented it rep- basically represented no, VFX, because, you know, if you ever seen it behind the screen screens to a lot of these movies, you know, they're using a green screen or something right. in the background that the visual effects part will fill up. And if it's not there, it's usually just a green box or a green arm sleeve if it's on an actor or something like that. So that's what it represents. Like, hey, if you don't, you know, we're not going to be here. And so, you know, and but there's no union to kind of to kind of say like, hey, no, these are the standards you have to pay, yeah. you know. That you have to get this much vacation time. They can't work this many hours in a week and, you know, health benefits and all that other stuff kind of gets rolled into being a part of the union. And unfortunately the VFX industry has a very hard time of kind of gathering their artists to do that, you know, because unfortunately people want to keep their jobs, right. You know, you got a family to feed, stuff like that. So, you know, whereas, you know, people that are working in a digital domain that get the project and be like, no, we can't strike. I got to do this. You know, I we can't get together to have a union. So it's unfortunate that, you know, essentially the, the VFX houses themselves are pitting themselves against each other to not have unions form because they know if that actually happens, they're screwed, <laughs> you know, um, and it's never come. It's never come to uh, fruition yet for VFX studios, unfortunately. Conversely, luckily, the animation guilds, so if you're working at, you know, uh, DreamWorks or Pixar or Disney Studios, something like that, Animation Guild was formed a long time ago, way back when they were doing the 2D stuff. So they, that union already kind of exists. So you already kind of have to live up to these hands. But again, it's always when it comes to unions and you know, these big studios in the work in, you know, it's always this kind of battle because, you know, the studio wants to get as much profit as possible. And they, you know, if the unions are kind of quote unquote siphoning some of that money away because they have to abide by these hourly standards or vacation time or whatever these you know the union usually is fighting for for the artists it's always a constant battle you know and it's unfortunately it's not just animation it's you know auto industry and all the a lot of these industries out there that actually have unions it's always a constant battle and that's one of the interesting things i find out again about working in this animation industry a lot of people have this kind of rosy colored kind of like mm-hmm. ooh, the new toy story or ooh, the new shrek or whatever and it's like oh my god this is amazing and it, but they don't know the kind of behind the scenes thing that you know it's kind of real world stuff that's still <laughs> happening you know that they don't know that's actually kind of going on in the background so yeah so yeah so what would you say was the biggest breakthrough in your career? Um, or if you had multiple breakthrough. So like, were you talking about like the thing that I felt most proud of or like just kind of in general, just like, I don't, I guess I'm, cause I mean, I don't know what a breakthrough, I, I guess I'll answer it like this. I think when I finally got to be, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, was it, uh, 
that uh, song in uh, Hamilton in the room where it happens. Mm -hmm. uh, Leslie Odom Jr., that song. Um, that was probably, and that actually happened at Rhythm Hughes where I actually got to be a supervisor. So, mm -hmm. you know, I worked my way up. And now I'm in these kind of meetings with the head of studios, watching dailies, making choices about things where it's only like maybe 10 of us, right, in this screening room. Um, very intimate, but I'm in the room where these decisions are being happened. Cause you know, as a worker, you're just kind of fed down. So it's like, okay, this is what we got to do. This is your assignment and got to do this, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, you might have questions of like, well, why are we doing it this way? Or, yeah. you know, why couldn't we do it that way? Or blah, 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 blah. But you know, as a, as you know, like a worker bee, you were just kind of, okay, I'll just do it or whatever. And that's always kind of been my, my thing. I I'm always one of the guys that I'm like, I want to be the one at least, in the room where it happens like i want to you know, and then have my say if i can you know try mm -hmm. to like put in my two cents of like well you really don't know the hair department so what you're asking for is ridiculous or stupid and i've actually done that and surprisingly got more respect telling some of these executives be like mm -hmm. nah that's a dumbass idea and they'd be like why and then you you know obviously you don't just say it just to say it you gotta you know, have a reason to come so yeah for me that was kind of my big breakthrough of finally walking into that kind of first screening of you know i forgot whether for a movie it was on but basically i'm in the room where it's the you know producer you know from the movie and the director from the movie and obviously some heads of you know the company in there as well and obviously other supervisors from other different departments and you're there and you're watching mm -hmm. the dailies and you're making your comments literally to the director like this is what was done here and all this other stuff and so for me that was actually kind of a big breakthrough because well place Excuse, excuse me, it's definitely a place I really wanted to be is, you know, there. Hamilton shop. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I remember, you know, being a manager and, you know, we'd have these meetings and, and we go invite some of the people, uh, the workers who are doing the work into the meeting and they don't realize, like, you were invited to this meeting for a reason because you're an expert at doing the task or the job and not all, like, superiors are coming from an arrogant space. They're mm -hmm. just like, oh, let me just give a solution or let me just try to say something. And then it's your job to be like, no, that won't work because you're the expert. But so many people have these different personalities where they're intimidated mm -hmm. and then they don't say yeah. anything. And it's like, yep. that's why you're in the room. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I personally am not one of those people. I, people that know me know, especially in a work setting, I will speak my mind and I don't care who I offend because I come from a more logical thinking of things. And, you know, unfortunately, you know, in a lot of this industry, there are, you know, executives or whoever that are making these decisions and they just don't know what it's going to cost. Again, like I said, that's why you're brought in here. So I can definitely see, depending on who you are, you know, you're getting dragged, I don't want to say dragged, but you get invited to one of these meetings and you're just sitting in there and there's executives or whatever. And you're just like, uh, <laughs> You know, I could definitely see the intimidation, but that's not really a factor for me because, you know, mm -hmm. like you said, there's a reason we have you in here. Right. Go ahead and do it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> no one's going to be offended. You know, hopefully, hopefully. I mean, right. depending on the personalities that you're working with, you might get that one dude that is, mm -hmm. you know, takes everything super seriously. But, you know, it just depends on the situation. But yeah, overall, you just, you want to be there and you want to, you know, kind of put your best foot forward, as it were. So, um, uh, being a black person in a predominantly white and male industry, has um, your background ever felt like a spotlight, or have you ever had to endure anything, or has it been pretty okay? Um, so, fortunately, I haven't really run into a lot of the microaggressions, um, mm -hmm. or even you know, you know, not micro and just aggressions generally. Um, yeah about being black in this industry i think i've been very fortunate now i don't know if i have blinders on and i just don't mm -hmm. see it um mm -hmm. i think my personality in the work industry would definitely garner some sort of a response <laughs> from somebody be like oh hey, man this guy is you know too urban i'll just put it that way you know he speaks his mind too much or whatever like you know mm -hmm. because i am that way so and i never really gotten that so i can't really say essentially what's been said behind closed doors, you know, of all the stuff that I've gotten responses from, we'd be like, oh, we appreciate, you know, his kind of 
straightforwardness and getting right to the mm-hmm. point, all this other stuff. And at least I've never been told or at least, you know, had someone come inside and be like, hey, by the way, you know, you know, the only reason they did that was because, you know, they're trying to fill some quota or whatever. Like, you know, mm-hmm. like I never really gotten any kind of feedback specifically based on my race. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I will say DreamWorks has done an amazing job since I've gotten there of being more inclusive. And this has kind of happened within the last couple of years, you know, George Floyd mm-hmm. and all that stuff. And it, obviously it's not mm-hmm. just DreamWorks, Netflix, and pretty much all the major companies are starting to do this coming out of the, you know, thing trying to do it. So they're doing a really good job to do that. Um, and I'm glad we have the Ben network on campus. And that's actually a larger part of the NBC universal thing. And mm-hmm. uh, Ben stands for black employees network. So we can mm-hmm. kind of network and stuff like that. So, you know, they've done a really good job of having these avenues to kind of go and, and, and kind of, you know, address any problems that people have had. But me personally, I haven't seen it. Mm-hmm. It hasn't really happened to me. Um, as far as a negative connotation of it. Mm-hmm. Um, I will say that I think the positive connotation of it, mm-hmm. um, again, talking about dreamers, because it's been happening recently, is getting that input and not just kind of, again, just making decisions by people that aren't, let's say, Black in this case, and they have mm-hmm. a Black character and they just want to kind of just do, this is what I think, you know. Mm-hmm. No, they're actually bringing in Black voices and stuff like that to be like, you know, mm-hmm. this, is, this is how we would see it or this is how we would think. And on a more, you know, with my job, you know, uh, I was, you know, assigned to be the head person for Jurassic Park Camp Cretaceous, right? So when I'm reading and kind of getting where this show is going, you know, it's more of an ensemble cast, but if there was kind of like I had to pick one that was like kind of the head of the cast, it's um, it's Darius, who's mm-hmm. a black teenager. And if you've seen that show, he's kind of the focus and the main, you know, protagonist of the show. And first I was like, oh, we're getting a CG show and the, the head person's a black kid. Thumbs up. You know, okay. um, and then uh, and then, you know, I was in I remember talking to some of the writers and stuff, writing some of these episodes and asking my mm-hmm. idea for certain things. But when the design of the characters come in, you know, they actually came to me. It was like, OK, he has more kind of an, you know, nappy style haircut, kind of flat top mm-hmm. type looking like thing. You know, how would you approach this? Blah, 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 blah. So for me, I was like a part of me was like so you just come to the black dude to ask this because the black dude's a question but uh, but i didn't want to do it that i'm like yes thank you for coming and asking me about this let's let's go with it and whereas you know i kind of helped uh our artists actually you know create the character so i wasn't fully hands-on with it i would occasionally mm-hmm. touch it in there to help out for trouble but i wasn't the main person but mm-hmm there was a lot of communication to the artists who was working on it from the executives and from the designers and the writers and stuff like that. So that was a positive thing to come out of it, you know, uh, that they were actually asking me for my opinion. And I don't think at least in my heart of hearts, I don't think it was just to kind of fill some sort of, you know, Mm -hmm. uh, kind of a thing that they're trying to fill up. I think they were genuinely asking it. And that's again, back to the environment just at the DreamWorks campus of just, you know, a lot of, you know, uh, collaborative bouncing ideas yeah. for forth. And unfortunately right now you can't really do it as much, but that's one of the big benefits in that it comes from, comes from that as well. Yeah. Cause when people try to approach, you know, black hair, particularly if they haven't done their yeah, research, particularly it can black get hair. really weird. <laughs> it can get really yes. weird. Yes, it so can. Even just being black, is like uh, the understanding that our hair is like, curly or if it's mm-hmm. like kinky it's just very tightly curled it's not like whatever people come up with like it's not yeah. a brillo pad it's like it's very soft like that's so, what you know, just being yeah. black is just like an asset <laughs> for sure and we even had the guys from hair love that won the oscar for the short i don't know if you mm-hmm. saw it but like i saw that and i was like yep i mean every black person would watch that short and was like yep and so you know mm-hmm. again i was very very happy that they won um yeah the Oscar for that. And then we were fortunate enough to have, bring them on campus and talk about the experience. And that was the same thing, you know, having the black perspective of this is what it's like. I mean, it's funny because it was hair and love and that just happens to be my department. So Mm -hmm. it was kind of a double kind of like, yay, you know, uh, (laughs) thing, but yeah, there's definitely um, that black connection as far as that is concerned. It was, it was just a micro thing. I know that people might not, you know, really care. But, yeah, but, you know, for me, I thought, like, that was good that they came to me to do that. Because I think 
I don't, it wasn't like the first black character we ever worked on, but you know, it's, it was like one of the first, I mean, cause it was right around when NBC universal Comcast, you know, acquired DreamWorks to be brought in. Mm -hmm. And so when it did it, it opened us up to work on their IP. And so Jurassic along with fast was like the first thing that we were working on that wasn't, you know, created from a DreamWorks property or come out of nowhere. So, and it's Jurassic park. So it's like, you know, mm -hmm. you kind of had a big, you know, kind of target to kind of hit for the show. Yeah. And then, you know, layer on top of that, Oh, it's a head black character. And then we got, I'm like, wow, you know, so um, it was just a, positive experience all, all the way around when it came to that kind of thing and bringing the black experience to it as well for sure so what has been like the evolution of hair simulation since you started and then do you, do you see any like innovative things that's happening for the future or yeah i mean i think i think when it comes to like hair simulation when it comes to the animation process I, you know i always feel like there's still base level right so there's still the basics of trying to get it it's just well what can you layer on top of it so as far as like an evolution i think the evolution has been more along the lines of real-time simulation so essentially what that means is that think of it like a video game i think it's an mm -hmm. easier way to put it like you know you're moving your character in the world and the hair's reaction to what you're right. actually doing so it's happening in real time you know a lot of the stuff that we work on um for you know for vfx or for film or film or tv or streaming or whatever or cartoons usually you know you have a scene they animate the scene and so we're simulating the stuff to the actions that the actors are actually doing it right so we're kind of i don't want to say we're put in a box but we kind of are because the character is doing whatever they want so i think the evolution has been hey we can do this while the things are happening um i know that you know certain things are going to more different um programs that kind of come out and they kind of mm -hmm. advance like the look so it, oh, it looks more realistic when you render it or you know but when it comes to actual simulation it's still kind of the same still kind of have to put in the same kind of things but the question is well you know it's going to take with simulation especially in the old days like for i don't know let's just say a 50 frame animation sequence depending on what the character is doing it could take you know hours but hours to render it out and right. i think the technology is advanced now where you know that same 50 frames you could actually do it in the computer while it's happening mm -hmm. and so you can make changes on the fly to what you're actually seeing so that's where i think the technology is going just to be able to see it in more real time than you would of mm -hmm. having to press a button wait to render it see it come out and be like ah it kind of popped over there let me kind of go back or fix some settings and then hit the button and then you wait and you render it again so i think that's where kind of the technology is going on top of like you know making it look better how light hits it and stuff so that part's advanced but i think the main part is just the processing power of it i think that's kind of the biggest i feel steps that we're making as far as progress of actually like simulating hair and stuff like that have you ever, have you had any moments like because you know i follow some um people who because you know i i, I have a a children's book called the black hair alphabet that i did oh and nice so it was like a response to the, the conversations in like the video game industry where you like, mm. have this avatar and you can only pick like bald and dress or something like that yeah, so I, yeah I mean yeah <laughs> so i like i modeled it but hopefully in the future maybe i can revisit it with like learning care or something like that but it i do because of that i do follow a lot of people um whether they are in america or in africa that kind of mm. do hair um and so do you ever have any moments where you're seeing something and you're like do you have those excited moments like i remember seeing the um into the spider-verse like mm. ps5 oh. trailer and i was like he got a taper <laughs> like <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah uh for, you know for me it's it's you know because you know i go to a black barber so you know it's very <laughs> hard for me not to kind of you know kind of tr try to take things in and out or whatever um mm -hmm. but like i think for me it was it, speaking of video games it was like nba 2k something mm -hmm. i think it was the latest one 2k 20 or something like that and again mm -hmm. you're going through the hair choices and i remember in the early 2k games it was like bald like fro maybe the flat top you know mm -hmm. but there wasn't like phase or there wasn't like you know uh uh 
like you could do like designs or something like that or right. you know it could be real curly but then not like afro curly like you know so it was actually in the latest game that i was going through and doing the creative the character and was like oh there's more options to do black hair in the game and stuff like that and i know nba is more black centric and stuff like that so mm-hmm. know, maybe i gotta boot up um some other game that isn't like black centric and see how many hair options that they got but um mm-hmm. yeah for me that that was kind of that but you know it's i think it's also i think the other two with hair is you know taking about the technology i think studios are now realizing we can actually do more and mm-hmm. so you know um we can actually get various styles of black hair like it doesn't just have to be the short short buzz cut or the afro or anything like mm-hmm. that like we can actually do the various things that are different so you know it's going to be a collaborative kind of a thing you know when they come up with these characters that they they make or whatever and you know it's my job to say like yeah we can actually kind of do that that's new and different haven't really seen that in you know uh media as far as streaming media for television shows and cg and be like yeah let's kind of do that you know Mm -hmm. and switch it up a little bit um so what have you learned throughout your you know life and career that will be beneficial advice to others um i mean kind of going back to the to the thing of being a supervisor like you know especially being a black person in this industry where there's like you said few of us mm-hmm. um but there's actually a lot more of us out there you know mm-hmm. we we kind of do that thing of we just kind of do our jobs heads down mm-hmm. straightforward you know cause no waves type thing and i would just say you know if you're fortunate enough to get into this industry and be a part of a, a good a good um, environment, you know, again, I think DreamWorks does a really good job of letting you speak your mind and not mm-hmm. kind of hold that against you, you know? So I would, I always try to give advice to students or anybody who's trying to get into this industry is like, know who you are first, know what you can bring and really kind of go for it. And don't let anybody tell you that you're not that thing whatever that thing is you know Mm -hmm. and someone told me like oh you don't really speak out too much i'm like have you seen my emails have you seen the chats clearly i speak up like you know and i know that that's kind of my strength like i don't take any bs you know i'm not Mm -hmm. one to kind of just sit back and watch something implode if i can't say something about it that's just been my strength i've been told like you know i like how he's a straight shooter he doesn't try to coddle Mm -hmm. the ideas of what this you know someone wants to do because you know it because they're arrogant and they think that they know better and they're like just do it I'm like no you don't know what you're talking about and that that's my strength so i would say mm-hmm. find out what their strength is if you if you're you know a fantastic artist and you know you are like you know go with that or if you, you know outspoken like myself just go with it um yeah. you know just kind of know who yourself because again people I, I i found out that people actually respect that more if you're just not authentic i think that's the word maybe i should look for um mm-hmm. it, it's not authentic self be your authentic self be who you are in this medium and people will respect it more than i think you think and it doesn't matter if you're black white asian you know yellow whatever um mm-hmm. you know because they're looking at you as the person you know right and i would just say that would just be my my, my advice mm-hmm so whether you're like reminiscing about back in the day or like kind of thinking about right now or even being in the industry, what do you love about animation and or VX, VFX? Like, what do you love about it? Um, I mean, I love that I'm doing the thing I grew up watching. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I think when I was growing up, the biggest thing that I wanted to have is see my name in those credits, you know, and see all the people scroll up in the credits. And it'd be amazing to be in a theater and, you know, there are people watching, they watch the thing that I do and my name scrolls up. I'm like, there I am, you know, I was there, I, I did that. So, you know, and that's still, you know, it's still kind of a driving force. I mean, I know, mm-hmm. you know, working is still a job, you know, there's still things, yeah. still we have to interact with people and, do all that kind of stuff and stuff like that but you know being able to kind of create something the collaborative effort to essentially start with nothing you know usually it's you know piece of, you know someone starts with the idea of a show right mm-hmm. and then you know they get to writers and they get to designers and then it you know gets to, and it goes with everything so you kind of are creating something essentially out of nothing and there's a final product and it comes out and 
you know, there's something about that kind of achievement that's still, you know, in the core of me, even dealing with the typical day BS sometimes of creating these shows, you know, in the end, when you see it on screen and when you see it, it's just, you know, it's still like amazing. And, you know, I always, you know, my grandfather, God bless his soul, would always, uh, you know, like to, Hey, there's my grand, my, there's my grand, there's my number one. That's his work, you know, and he's always going around and just telling all of his friends and people like, hey, that's my son. And that makes me kind of feel good. I mean, if, you know, if you had that black grandfather, black, you know what you're doing. <laughs> and so, uh, so yeah, so that, that part still kind of makes me feel good. And that's why I, I like doing it. So, so yeah, that's pretty much what I, I kind of I get out of it a lot. It's just that, that kind of having those kind of feelings and experiences and, you know, um, like I said, when I see it, like when I saw Jurassic, I mean, I love that movie, love that franchise. And I was, mm -hmm. I got to admit, when it first came across, I'm like, oh my God, we're doing Jurassic. And then the fact that it's still connected to the thing, like the way, yeah. it's not like, oh, it's, we're just trying to do a, something that's not connected, it's whatever. You know, no, no, this is going to be an integral part of the story. And it's, you know, the director's coming on campus occasionally, checking over our work and stuff like that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I actually, Steven Spielberg came to our campus once and that was amazing. Um, and knowing that, you know, this is his baby and now I'm part of it. I'm like, Ooh, but then, you know, when you actually see it and, you know, you, you see online and, you know, whatever reviews or whatever, and they're mostly positive and good. I'm like, Oh my God. So it, it makes you kind of feel good. I'm like, Oh, yeah, okay. That's why I kind of do it. And even I like it, you know, and getting friends saying their kids love the show and they Hey, this guy, you know, my friend worked on it. I'm like, Hey, and they go crazy and stuff like that. And, that stuff feels good. Yeah. Um, so as um, someone that is well into your career, um, have you made... Oh, you make me sound old. <laughs> well, I didn't call you a veteran. <laughs> no, but I mean, you're, we're working our way up to veteran. <laughs> yes. I mean, you're not a you're not an entry-level person, so... <laughs> Thank what you. what have you decided what your purpose in regard to like blackness and black professionals in animation is whether it's like mentorship or just like being yourself and being that representative have you decided that or is it just innately just happening as you go along i think it innately happened you know if i could kind of go off on another tangent here so uh <laughs> so for me i don't know what it was i forget i, I forgot what the motivation was but you know um something happened within me and i realized i've been doing this for a while um but i never really kind of connected to my blackness to it i just kind of i was just like a worker right like i never really kind of thought about you know being black in this industry i just kind of just did it you know yeah um and i don't know what happened i don't know i can't remember the thing but something inside of me was just like you know some i wanted to connect to that kind of blackness maybe i had to talk with my mom and you know, I know what she, how she's uh, really kind of connected to her blackness growing up. She, you know, I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to say anything, but let's just say that she was part of some certain organizations that were really <laughs> connected to the black, to the black experience when she was growing up. And I know like, you know, my dad would take me to the Million Man March and Million Family March, and, you know, stuff like that, that kind of really got back to the thing. So, I mean, maybe as a talk of that, and it kind of sparked something. And I was like, you know, I need to do something. And right around that time, uh, Ben was starting up on campus. And mm -hmm. they were, I, I think I passed by them. We were do, they were doing like booths set out on campus to join. Hey, we've got this Black Employees Network, you know, at the Dreamer campus. You know, we're starting up a, a thing with like Nikkei and stuff like that. And so it just kind of happened. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to do it. I never really done things like that before. I kind of just, my blackness was kind of in the background sort of like I knew it was there, but I didn't really actively try to do things mm -hmm. to kind of promote it or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I came, they had the booth and I was like, what is this? And they were like, Oh, we're starting this up. You know, it's part of the NBC universal. Like they had it there already, but now it's kind of being brought to like the campus and stuff. I was like, that's cool. That's convenient. Cool. We can kind of get meetings here. And so, uh, so I signed up for it. And then um, I remember that first meeting and I walk in there and I'm like, I have never seen this many black people work at this company ever. And I, at this point I had been there for like seven years 
And I'm like, <laughs> I literally thought I was like me, maybe a couple of the dudes I would see in the hallway or something and like that was it. And I'm seeing there's like 20, 30 people in here. And, you know, when I say it was like being at a black barbecue, you know what I'm talking about. We were all, you know, congregated in this, you know, space in the room and sure as crap, it felt something was like kind of filled a little bit of like, yeah, "Yeah, these are my people. These are my kind of thing. This is the thing that we do. I kind of miss this, you know, stuff like that. And Mm -hmm. essentially being a part of that led to the different events and stuff and panels you know, and stuff that we've done. And so for me, I think the biggest thing out of like making a difference or thing was one of the events we had was with inner city, I'll put that in quotes, uh, inner city urban schools um, (laughs) coming to the campus, like coming to the campus and we kind of show them throughout the campus what we do and different projects and stuff like that. And, you know, a lot of them obviously were most of the majority of them were black. But, you know, I mean, I, I never attended a um, quote unquote, urban school. I lived in Inglewood. I was going to go to Inglewood High. And my mom was like, nope, you're, I work in Westwood. So I happened, she did her thing. And I happened to go out to school in Westwood, you know, well, pretty well all my schools, like elementary, junior high, high school, were all on, in, in the Westwood area, which is more predominantly white and more upscale mm-hmm. or whatever. But so, but, you know, I knew, you know, I lived in the neighborhood. I knew what, you know, what these schools were mostly kind of composed of. So I knew that the opportunity that they had to come to Glendale um, and go to the campus and experience that they probably didn't would probably would never have happened if the bin organization hadn't got together right. you know and 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 organized that and going through my spiel of stuff you know you have the i mean you know if you've ever been you know, hang around these kids that go to these schools you know the kind of attitude aside from just being you know teenagers or whatever you kind of know the attitude a lot of them have when it comes to this but i was pleasantly surprised and made wrong that a lot of their eyes they were so grateful for being there and I got mm-hmm. so many questions about how can I get in this industry? And it's a question that we wouldn't, I don't think they would have any other avenue to right. ask and see, you know, because it's all the members have been and we're doing the presentations and stuff like that and seeing it. And, you know, I remember more specifically, there was this one kid and, I, you know, I gave him the look, I looked him up and down and be like, okay, one of these, one of these guys, you know. And I remember him asking and really being, and I thought this guy's really being authentic with the questions that he's asking me now. Like I thought, you know, one of those kids that were just into basketball and sports and whatever stereotypes you want to throw on the inner city black kid. Mm -hmm. I had them unfortunately in my head when I just looked them up and then we, you know, I talked to him and thing, talked to him on the side and I'm like, this is what I should be doing, you know, changing, their minds to think that, hey, you know, you don't have to be pigeonholed to whatever media right. or whoever is saying that they need to do to be successful in this world, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and we're obviously a lot of us that were working on campus were kind of proof of that. So for me, that's what I feel I kind of need to kind of keep doing, whether it be, you know, having this amazing interview with such as yourself and it being on the internet so people can look at it, or, you know, being part of being on campus and organizing schools to come in and show them like, Hey, there are other ways to do it. And if you happen to have an artistic bone in your body, we have that. If you actually want to be uh, more of a, a, a PA, you like to work and be a manager of people or groups of people. Hey, there, there are jobs for that here too. Or, yeah. Hey, if you like to work in, you know, work with, you know, electronical, like, you know, stuff, like you're more hands-on with like machines and computers and you're, into that kind of thing. Hey, we have jobs for that here as well. There are opportunities for you to do that. So, you know, for me, that's what I get most out of, or at least I feel like I should try to be doing when it Mm -hmm. comes to uh, trying to impart all this stuff to the, you know, young black people that possibly want to get into the, I'll just say entertainment industry. I know I'm focusing on animation and stuff, but it's, it's the whole entertainment entertainment industry is like this behind the scenes. You don't necessarily have to just be the actor or the actress right. on the screen you can there's a lot of things that are available behind the camera as well yeah and that's the importance of this platform is because like coming from certain areas whether it's urban or rural you don't have a um neighbor that is in animation or you don't have like oh i have a friend down the street or a friend that i know like that's that's rare <laughs> to know somebody in the animation industry so that's why stuff like Ben and like this platform is important so that there could be that exposure because that exposure is the key. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's supposed to be really key because, excuse me, like when I grew up, I, I, I mean, there was never any kind of, excuse me, a black organizational group that, you know, reached out to me or anything. It was, I was just motivated and that's what I wanted to do. Right. You know, I, I had that kind of uh, spark early on. So that was my main motivation of like, I don't, I, I don't care if I'm black or not male or not. I don't care. I want to do this. So I'm going to do whatever I can to do that, you know? Um, so I just happen to just do this, but I know a lot of the kids are not told that, Hey, you can do this. You can be a manager or you can be, you know, an artist or a supervisor or whatever doing this stuff in this industry. So it, it is very important to kind of just get it out there that, you know, there are options for you, not just what people tell you in school or whatever. Um, yeah. So what do you hope generally, just what do you hope for the future of like animation as far as innovation, storylines, characters, whatever, like, what do you hope to see? Well, I mean, I, I mean, you know, keeping it within the black theme kind of centric attitude that we got kind of going on here. Like for me, I like seeing more black projects now being kind of Mm -hmm. pushed into kind of Uh, I don't want to say mainstream, but, you know, being pushed out there to these big platforms and have success. Like, you know, um, I I mean, Jurassic, I mean, again, it's an ensemble cast. It's within thing. But, you know, you have a black kind of lead character and that's like kind of good. Um, You know, like I said, Hair Love getting the Oscar, having that kind of being exposed. Um, And and as far as the animation, like one of my favorite shows is um, is Kipo in the mm-hmm. age of the wonder beast now you know a lot of people are like kipo that's not a black show and i'm like okay if you really watch the show it kind of is i mean if you look at the voice cast and you know the main character is actually half asian half black you know mm-hmm. so it's very maybe not you might not say you know i think Dion cole is one of his best friends and then one of the you know the best friends um is also a central character that travels around him and there he's black and stuff mm-hmm. like that black and gay oh sorry spoiler alert if you haven't seen it apologize <laughs> it's still a good show um but it's like seeing a show like that come out and then get the praise within yeah. i think the animation community i don't know how popular it is outside of that but you know mm-hmm. i'm still going to you know io9 or something like that on the web and they have splash pages of episodes of the show and i'm like wow i never really saw that before and so for me yeah. I like the direction that, you know, the animation industry is recognizing. And I got to kind of thank Black Panther a little bit, even though it shouldn't have come down to Black Panther to do it. But, you know, mm-hmm. they see a movie have that kind of success with pretty much an all black cast. And, it, it, you know, execs are like, ooh, you know, you know, there's something we can do here. And it's like, yeah, there's something you can do there. And it doesn't always have to be, you know, Tyler Perry and Medea and, and stuff like that, you know, mm-hmm. and kind of go out of that range and still produce some really good stuff. So, you know, obviously in the realm of animation and VFX and stuff. So, you know, so for me, I'm actually kind of seeing that and I'm hopeful that that trend kind of keeps coming and hopefully we'll get more animation based movies. Like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm talking like Pixar tentpole events. I mean, I know I, for me, I look at Coco with the Hispanic mm-hmm you know Mm -hmm. uh, culture and that movie just blowing up and everybody loving that and it's a really great movie but it really did a good job of capturing that i'm i'm still kind of waiting for that to happen for Mm -hmm. you know uh black centric animated film i know soul was kind of that uh a little bit but you know i think it kind of went into more of the more kind of uh metaphysical stuff in that too and i know we had it It was good you know it did have kind of that but i want more of that i want to kind of push yeah. a little bit more of like kind of maybe what like a coco did and stuff like that really kind of getting in there and kind of doing and i think we will aspect. you know yeah i think we will i think they will um mm-hmm. if, you know because it was successful i mean soul won oscars so you know mm-hmm. um if that just kind of keeps happening execs and studios will you know start you know shooting more money to those those kinds of projects and not be hesitant to you know short you know give them the short end of the stick when it comes to it so we'll see that's what i'm hopeful for for sure so last question if someone was producing a documentary about you what things would you want them to highlight about your life outside of your work in animation um i would say I, you know, I, to be perfectly honest, it would probably be the relationship that I have with my father surrounding baseball. Like, mm-hmm. 
you know, uh, maybe kind of, I don't know if it's like a Field the dreams type thing. I don't know if you saw that movie, but it, <laughs> I was it was like, kinda... are you going to, are you going to relate to a movie? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, a lot of that movie is about the father son dynamic type mm -hmm. thing. And it, sur it was surrounding baseball. So I think it would be the same thing for myself and my father kind of growing up and, you know, my life basically surrounding that thing um, that's outside of, you know, me being in animation. So, I mean, if there was a documentary, I'd like to focus on that because, you know, it's, you know, I'm constantly surprised kind of what life kind of throws at you. I know I'm kind of getting a little bit off subject here, but like some of the things that kind of happen in your life, you know, mm -hmm. you know, that, you know, someone upstairs is definitely kind of directing this play starring me, you know, mm -hmm. sure. Like, you know, I believe in God and I'm like, God, why are you like some of these things that you've done in my life? It's just, it's, too convenient to be part of a story. You know what I'm saying? Like, for example, like, you know, I met my wife at DreamWorks. We were working on the side building and it was only because I got on, she was leaving work the same time. I, and we were got into an elevator. She was there. I walked in at that time. It was the perfect mm -hmm. meet cute for people that, you know, know kind of stories and what a meet cute is. And, mm -hmm. you know, I can go along in that story, but the timing of that, and now she's my wife you know, about to have a, a child. So like, that's nice. an amazing thing. Thank you. Uh, and then just when it comes to like, back to my, my, my dad in baseball, like, you know, after high school, it was something we wanted to keep going. So we would always get together on Sundays and go out there and play baseball and just do practicing and just to kind of keep it going to have our connection. Cause you know, obviously we're living together or anything like that. I was kind of doing my own thing, mm -hmm. but it, it was a thing that kind of kept us together. And uh, we, we happened just, happenstance a team of predominantly older gentlemen uh, who mm -hmm. would just randomly come by the park we were playing at would just kind of join us in and eventually a team form and it was like the first time i was able to kind of play on the same team as my dad yes it's kind of an adult league type thing but you know i never actually played on a team with him um so that was kind of an experience that we kind of had and we meet interesting people i don't know if you've seen um uh, what is that movie? Uh, Trial of the Chicago Seven. It just kind of came out, um, mm -hmm. and it was about the um, it was about the guys that were shoot. I had it on me. Uh, it was not for the Oscar, but uh, my point being is one of the main guys that were in there. His name is Tom Hayden, um, mm -hmm. and he was on our baseball team. I did not know who this guy was. And he's obviously he's very famous in you know some circles, and obviously he was in that movie, and they just made a movie about him. But I remember my dad; we were practicing one day with the team, and he's like, "Do you know who that is?" I'm like, "Yes, that's Tom. He's our first baseman." <laughs> that's it. That's all I know. He's a little bit older, can't really run the first base as well. Still makes good contact with the ball, but yeah, it's Tom. He's our first baseman. What I mean, he's like, "No, no, no, no. Do you know who he really is?" I'm like, well, I mean, I think he's really a baseball player. He's like, okay, let me reframe this for you, son. He's well known. Do you know where he's kind of maybe known from? And I'm like, no. You know, <laughs> and he would, and he would tell me about you know the trial of the of, of the seven and his activism yeah. work and all this other stuff. You know, was I think a state state councilman of California who's doing all this amazing stuff. And obviously, I'm seeing in the movie, and I'm like, oh, okay, cool. Um, now, but I was like. No, still, and still whoop, right over my head. And he's like, okay, do you know who Jane Fonda is? And I was like, yeah, the workout tape lady. You know, she's working out with Jane Fonda. He's like, oh, yeah, so he is her ex-husband. They have, she have a kitty. And I'm like, oh, my God, he was married to Jane Fonda? So that's what, you know, clued me in to, like, you know, but it's just, again, it just goes back to the amazing thing of, like, you never know what's going to happen in life because right. these random dudes just showing up at our park, surrounded by the fact that me and my dad wanted to just go out and toss the ball around, hit some balls, take some filters and all this other stuff. And it just so happened these guys would just come by and just we just kind of formed a team. They kind of knew each other. And it led to me actually on a week in, week out, you know, yeah. all, you know, until unfortunately Tom passed away a couple of years ago. Like he was out there on the field every time. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, now with the movie coming out, I'm pretty sure his name is a little bit more well known and stuff like that. But like I was there on Sundays for three hours just playing ball which is a simple yeah. thing like that and so that's what the documentary i would say would want to be about you know something surrounding that and kind of involving all that kind of stuff so 
That'd be cool. I could see that. I don't know who would play me though. Michael B. Jordan. There you go. I just play everybody's Michael B. Jordan. That's who's gonna play me in the movie. <clears throat> That's what I love about the like multiple ways to be black. He's like Chicago Seven, Civil Rights, Jane Fonda. Oh, like, <laughs> yeah. That's yeah. Like I, yeah, Jane Fonda. Oh, wow, that's, he's very exposed. With, okay. Yep. 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 That is yep. so funny. Hilarious. <laughs> I'm so stupid. <laughs> All right, so if people want to like follow you on social media or see your work, I don't know. Uh, your website, but... I would say I don't have a website, or I think the website is still up. I would say probably the best way to contact me would probably be through LinkedIn. So I'm definitely on there. Um, that would probably be the best way. I, I mean, I have like an Instagram, but I'm like not on there. Same thing with Facebook, like I'm not on there. So I wouldn't. So if if that's the way you want to contact me, I definitely would not go that route. I would just say I cheat check LinkedIn a, a lot more. So I think you found me, I don't know if there's like a specific link, but um, I'm definitely on there. Just type of Philadelphia. I think my picture's up there. So you see me here, look for the guy that kind of looks like me. Right. Um, and I'll definitely be, uh, I'm definitely really um, respond. I don't want to say quickly, but I definitely respond. Like I don't just kind of, I don't know who this person is click and then just kind of mm -hmm. <laughs> go off to the side. So, you know, send me a little message. So at least I just know who you are. Cause there are a lot of random people. I'm just like, right. Oh, way out of nowhere i'm like ah you're just spamming all the case you know just yeah. say a little something and be like oh i saw you on uh deborah's channel and be like oh okay cool um yeah. and i definitely can kind of reach out that way for sure but yeah that would probably be the best way to kind of get in contact with me and i am a testament that is how he's on this platform because i reached out only <laughs> yes exactly that's how <laughs> hey it works it works <laughs> all right so i want to thank you for coming and giving your time and coming on my platform. I no appreciate problem. it. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And to everyone out there, I want you to like so I know it's real. Comment and tell me how you feel. Subscribe to Seal the Deal and sign up for post notifications to show your zeal. And I'll see you in the next video. Peace. Bye, everybody.